Cool. Welcome. Welcome to day five, the final day of DevCon. It has been an incredible week. We've gone deep into the Ethereum platform, seen exactly what dApps are capable of. I don't even think the beginning of that. And today, we start off with a very special presentation by Nick Zabo. Uh, he is a blockchain pioneer, and he is here to present on the history of the blockchain. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So yeah, I'm talking about smart contracts and Ethereum. Good morning, City of London, Ethereum developers. So I'm going to start off talking about the origins of some of these ideas, some of the philosophical origins. Um, to the left here, we have Ayn Rand. To the right, Frederick Hayek, who had um, were big um, political and philosophical inspirations to the cypherpunks, where many of these ideas came out of. And in, uh, so Ayn Rand's, uh, I've never finished one of her books, but she was very influential nevertheless. <laughs> Um, she came up with the idea of Galt's Gulch, which is a place you could um, form your own independent community and um, declare your independence from corrupt institutions and society. And pretty much a, a complete fantasy when she wrote it based on fake physics and stuff. But um, Tim May, who is in fact a physicist, um, worked for Intel studying the um, how to prevent their, protect their chips from radiation, um, came up with the idea of Galt's Gulch in cyberspace and kind of ideal to shoot for. And so another, and basically cryptography in the cypherpunks movement, protect yourself with cryptography. That would be your shield. Um, and Frederick Hayek, another big influence on us, was uh, said not so fast. He had studied the basis, the protocol layer underlying society, underlying free markets, which we champion. And property, contracts, and if you go to law school, you'll study these in your first year of law school, property, contracts, etc. And all that requires security. So we wanted to apply computer science, apply the new technology, take advantage of Moore's law to uh, minimize vulnerability to strangers, maximize security. And, solve and in doing so, solve ambitious problems of uh, the Hayekian nature, such as uh, privatize money and nonviolently enforce property and contracts. And so that is the milieu where ideas like smart contracts, the first blockchain designs, and the first cryptocurrency designs came out of. And if you wanted to sum that up in all one thing, it's try to secure as much as possible. So with cryptography, traditional cryptography, you're just trying to secure one narrow thing. You have communications, and you're trying to secure it from a third party. You can't really secure it from the party you're talking to. If they forward your email, it doesn't matter how well your email is encrypted. Um, so it's trying, uh, encryption, traditional encryption is trying to, to uh, solve one narrow problem. But now we have the opportunity. Well, let's, let's go back. So now we have the opportunity with Ethereum um, well, let me go back. So David Chalm and Digital Cash expanded this and said, let's, let's apply this to money. Let's try to make money, the transfer of money private. And so he solved a privacy problem, although the banks didn't like that, so it wasn't taken up. But he had a technical solution for solving the privacy problem. What he didn't solve was this problem right here. And that is a centralization problem. And so there was a bunch of digital cash startups, David Chams being among them, that, that they either failed or they became centralized systems like, like PayPal. Because we didn't know how to do decentralization at that point. But um, so, so coming out of those experiences, we, 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 we expanded our definition of security. And we realized there were a lot of bad assumptions being made in security at that time. No, one of the big ones being the trusted third party. The certificate authority in an encryption system is a classic example of a trusted third party that got introduced. And pretty quickly, they became to usurp, at the height of the internet bubble, um, VeriSign, which basically specialized in being a certificate authority, it was worth tens of billions of dollars just on that basis alone that they owned this bottleneck in, in, a, in the 
system of cryptography um, securing the internet. It's, it's gotten a little more broken up now, but it's still a bottleneck, as is the domain name system. Um, and you can go back farther in history and see that um, in industrial era, around the turn of the century, 1900, early 1900s, we had a lot of very centralized security tech, or a lot of centralized industrial technology. So radio was centralized um, broadcast, um, railroads, especially railroad stations, very centralized, and newspapers. This is a picture of an old steam press here, or it could be a steam press or run by diesel, but the point is a large, large scale manufacture, just a few newspapers per, per city or even per country. And that's, and so when the communists came along, Mr. Vladimir Lenin there, um, they had some mutinous soldiers. They had actually had some workers as well, but mostly they had mutinous soldiers. And they only had to take over a few urban places to get a stranglehold in society. The railroad stations, the handful of radio stations, and the handful of newspapers. And then they had control over society. Um, and physical wealth has not necessarily been very secure either. So the Aztecs, um, compelled tribute from tribes in, in gold and amassed gold. The uh, Spanish looted the Aztecs' gold. Sir Francis Drake there on the right um, and other English pirates looted their gold. Jump ahead in history from the Spanish. Jump ahead in history a little bit. And the end of the gold standard, part of the end of the gold standard, the part the economists don't tell you because it, it violates their assumptions of voluntary transactions, is the German U-boats during World War one and World War II are sending significant fractions of Allied and especially British boats to the bottom of the ocean. So the British stopped being able to transport gold. If you look at the gold standard, the way the, the trust works in a gold standard, anybody needs to be able to up to a gold window and cash in their banknotes for gold. And because they couldn't transport gold around during the war, that was one of the reasons the gold standard collapsed. And then to the bottom right here, we have Franklin Roosevelt, who confiscated gold in the US. And I didn't put a picture of an x-ray machine here, but in, in modern times, gold is even less secure now. So that, that Bitcoin and Ethereum as cryptocurrencies really um, are superior to that now. So, so what we did was we said, let's take decentralization per computer science is much more automated and secure. So if we take... Um, an Ethereum blockchain um, and put some smart contracts on it. The sub it's only going to substitute in any given case for a small fraction of what these guys on the left. The guys on the left, the armies of accountants, the armies of uh, investigators, police officers, the armies of lawyers. Um, in any given case, it's only going to substitute for a small fraction, but the cost savings is so high that those, those particular applications are going to be pretty compelling and especially across, across national borders, places, because um, in, insecurity and just about all IT right now is very insecure, no matter what the security people tell you. There's hacks happening all the time. This is the latest JP Morgan hack, um, identity theft. Um, and what they had to do, they had to have a strong partnership with law enforcement. The security isn't the protocol itself. It is the police officers in traditional finance. It is law enforcement, the accountants, the investigators, the lawyers. So that's the reason, big, one of the big reasons that traditional finance is stuck inside its national silos and it's highly regulated. So um, cryptocurrency, and in particular today Ethereum, helps solve that. So through decentralization, and I'll talk a little bit here about what kind of decentralization is good. So if you think of traditional finance has thing called separation of duties. And one of the crucial things important in separation of duties is that the people that are separated, you need several people to perform a task to get it done. So in that sense, broad sense, it's like um, Ethereum. Um, but you want independence. You want each of the nodes to be independent as possible. So one crude measure you can do is how many nodes we have, um, like four, about nearly 400 nodes here for Ethereum. Um, but the actually more important thing to look at is look on the map and see the diversity. You've got um, a node there in the middle of the Indian Ocean. That's really good. You've got Singapore, 
you've got somewhere near Vietnam there. Those, those are the best nodes because those, those are most likely to be the, the, more likely to be the independent nodes. And there's all sorts of other ways you can estimate independence too, but the point is the, the, the actual sheer number of nodes is just a proxy measure of, of something more important below that. So to get to smart contracts, there are two ways people talk about smart contracts. They're both valid. Um, the way Ethereum talks about it is long-lived, just as sometimes a synonym for a long-lived process, a contract or distributed app. The Original and still a quite meaningful definition of smart contract is it acts like a contract. Um, there's automated performance, there's verification, it's, it's doing the function of, of a contract or it's analogous to what a contract would do. So typically in a smart contract of that kind you have two parties or you have one party in the blockchain, something like that. So now there's a strong distinction to be made between dry code smart contracts and wet code, traditional law. So I can go over it here. There's uh, laws based on our minds, our wetware. Um, it's based on analogy. Um, software tends to ground on Boolean logic, bits, um, hard mathematics. Um, the security um, of law is based on the ultimate threat of coercion that you're going to go to imprisonment if you violate a court order to pay somebody. Even in a civil lawsuit, you could get charged with contempt and go to prison. So that's ultimately what the security of, of wet law grounds down on. And for software, for blockchains, it grounds down on the replication of the blockchain and on cryptography. So, and the law is more flexible, software is more rigid. Um, and an area, the law, as I've said, tends to be bashed in jurisdictional silos. Um, software tends to be independent, grows seamlessly cross-border. Lawsuits are very expensive, especially if they're cross-border. Um, the software can get very, very cheap once you amortize the capital costs. So now I'm going to talk about a couple, some applications um, that, that interest me that don't necessarily widely get talked about. So back in the day, back um, when writing was first invented, um, seals were, were a really big deal. If you go into the archaeological layers, you'll find a lot of these. This is a seal of, of King Darius of Persia, but they're all, it's also very commonly used for commercial transactions. Um, you'd take your seal and you'd rub it on the clay, and that would be your signature, and it would also provide tamper evidence. So today, So today, seals um, are still widely used. They're very important. Um, they tend to go along with recording serial numbers. You'll seal something up, seal up a door, seal up an evidence bag, um, and so forth, and write down the number, and you get a log of what's there. And you can go back and, and verify things haven't been tampered with. Um, now, the blockchain could help quite significantly here. Um, instead of keeping an insecure offline log or, or an even more insecure online log without the blockchain, um, you keep your log online. You can keep it as, as ongoing hashes and also as the descriptions of the evidence, what's in the evidence bag itself if you want to use that for further smart contracts processing. And that's a general pattern that's good in Ethereum is that you put the proof of evidence on the blockchain for taking physical stuff and reflecting on the blockchain, you want to put the proof of evidence on the blockchain, but you also want to have semantic information for um, contract code to be able to play with. And you can do this with physical spaces as well. And this is a scheme I came up with, um, I guess over a decade ago now, uh, for a smart property. And I call it Proplets. You can Google that online if you like. Um, and basically what proplets do is they look to the blockchain to see who owns them. Um, they're kind of like a SIM card and, that they, and, and the electronics on your smartphone that they know where they're at, they know um, things they can sense in the environment, but the main thing they know is who owns them and what the instructions are that they are to follow. And one of the applications of this is the auto repo auto, or more generally the auto repo collateral, where um, if you use 
your physical device is security for a loan, then that can get automatically repossessed. And that, that allows credit to be um, much more efficiently used. So there was, for example, an offshore rig that costs tens of billions of dollars. An offshore facility uses collateral in a big business deal. But since the, the creditors did not actually have a way to gain physical control over it, um, they're out of luck and they're out, of, out tens of billions of dollars so they can't actually repossess the collateral right now. Whereas if they had these devices, they could. So current project I'm currently working on is very fun. Um, financial assets on the blockchain. So the first generation, which I invented in 1998, is the trust minimized token. So you trust minimize the transfer of uh, tokens from one person to another. I call these secure property titles. The most common name they're called now is colored coins. And they trust minimize, again, it's, it's, it's securing a particular thing. It's securing the transfer of ownership of a thing. But there's other things, and even more important things, you want to secure with financial assets. And so the second generation is trust minimizing the cash flows. That's, that's what you really want in your financial assets. You want the dividends, the coupons, et cetera. So um, that's what I'm working on now with my partner, Donald McIntyre. And this is another cool one I recently worked on. Um, this is social networks plus Ethereum. So blockchains are back office technology. You don't see them directly. Um, in Ethereum, you have Mist um, as a wallet cross-browser to allow you to interact directly. But this is another interesting um, way you could interact with blockchains, and that is through social networks. And so tip bots are a, very, are a very simple example of this now. This is an architecture I designed for a more decentralized version of tip bots that can do more than, more than tipping, more than paying. You can actually do some smart contract stuff initiated from a social network. And you start off with... Um, largely in the traditional web space, linking your social network accounts together. And then you use them to, uh, once you do that, you can instruct from the social network the payments, swaps, other smart contract things. And so in summary, let's try to think about security more broadly. Instead of thinking narrowly, we are, encryption is security and, and nothing else is, or Transfer of tokens is security and nothing else is. Let's try to secure everything. Let's try to protect everything that's important to us as much as we can. And not like this, though. <laughs> Let's do it like this with Ethereum. Thank you very much. <laughs>